We've chosen a route along the Silk Road that basically connects the, 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 uh, the capital of Tang Dynasty China, Xi'an, which was one great marketplace and one great endpoint for goods, with another endpoint, which is Baghdad, which was the head uh, or the seat of the Abbasid Caliphate, which really allowed goods then to be dispersed from the Western Mediterranean. We've tried to make the entire show very atmospheric. So there's nothing that sort of engages people more than the Silk Road than to see the beasts of burden on the Silk Road, the camels actually carrying goods through a field of sand dunes, which could have been in the Taklamakan Desert of Central Asia. This is a particularly sophisticated loom from the Tang Dynasty. We got this from the, the National Silk Museum of China in Hangzhou in China. And looms like this actually have been found, and depictions of looms like this have been found. This loom would have taken two people to operate. It's over 17 feet long, and it's an incredibly complex machine, so much so that it allows very, very intricate patterns to be, to be, to be woven and in a variety of different techniques. Well, the selection of instruments we have here are reproductions, well, not really reproductions, but they're antiques, some up to 150 years old, of Chinese instruments that were played in the distant past. Chinese instruments didn't change that much in the thousand or so years since Silk Road days. And we have figures like people playing these sorts of instruments here and here, which are representative you know, of the time, of the Silk Road. Many of these same things, like I said, are played today. Even the same melodies are played today. So you can actually here play these in the exhibit. You can play them both singly or you can play them together to hear how that they sound both individually and in concert. From, from Xi'an we moved to Turfan, and Turfan is an oasis town in Xinjiang in western China. It's the homeland of the Uyghur ethnicity who are people who, although they're Chinese, that they're not Han Chinese, that they're more related to Persian people. They speak an individ their own individual language which is called Uyghur. If you went to Turfan today, the markets would look pretty much just like this. I mean, that they're bustling places full of fruits, full of vegetables, full of mercantile goods, and it was just the same way during Tang Dynasty times. One of the things that made Turfan and Dunhuang and Kashgar such important marketplaces is because that they really laid at the nexus between, between north and south trade routes as well. So you had furs, you had metal, you had things like that coming down from Siberia, from Mongolia, from those places. But one of the big problems is if you live in an oasis town in the middle of the desert, is just how do you get water there? There's a very ingenious Central Asian technique called the Karez system, where water can be carried through an underground system of, of channels, which are then aerated by vertical channels as well, up to a hundred miles from mountains. In Turfan, that the, that the, the uh, water comes from the base of the Kunlun and Tianshan Mountains, and it travels just underground through these culverts like this, up to 75 or 80 miles. This is a representation of an Islamic engineering invention. It's a water clock. It works on the same principle that a sand dial does, except that rather than sand running through, water runs through. So as the water goes down, there's a float in the top chamber that goes down as well, which pulls a series of counterweights, which then makes the guy up on the top turn, and he has a pointer that then points to the particular times of the day. So in antiquity, someone would have had to fill it up every day. We have a pump, electric pump underneath which does that for us, but nevertheless, it's almost an exact copy of the kind of thing you would have seen in Baghdad in the ninth century. This is a recreation of an astrolabe, and an astrolabe is a celestial instrument that allows one to be able to sight on particular stars and not only tell what time of day it is, but with the appropriate tables and mathematics to be able to tell what your latitude is. So that there's a story which goes that these were originally created by Islamic engineers to be able to tell what time of the day it is to pray. That's probably not true because they're probably derivative, or we know them to be derivative from instruments which the, the, both the Greeks and the Romans used. However, they're much more sophisticated. Toward the end of the time period that we're looking at, but starting even a little bit before that, the maritime sea trade started to outpace the overland sea trade. And this is to a variety of reasons. One was some of the desertification that I talked about earlier. Another was just that uh, it was so much cheaper and easier to transport goods by sea down the coast of 
China down through the Straits of Malacca, across the Indian Ocean to the Persian Gulf, then to take them overland. Also, political instability in Central Asia played a big part of it also. Arabic mariners began to use boats like this one. This is a recreation of a dhow, which was an, a sailing ship which was capable of very, very long overseas voyages. What we're standing in then now is the, is the interior of the hull of what a dhow would have looked like. This is based on a shipwreck from the Straits of Malacca, which was collected several years ago. Instead of shipping containers like we use on ships now, we have these big ceramic urns that were then packed with things like porcelain pots, porcelain plates, and other kinds of luxury goods that uh, were made in China and then moved all the way to to Persia, to uh, what's now Iraq, and then disseminated throughout the Mediterranean by the maritime kingdoms of Venice, Genoa, and others. All of the cities that we talk about in this exhibit still exist today. Granted, they've changed a lot, but there's still vestiges of the old Silk Road that one can still see there. But on a more larger scale, we can look at what the Silk Road really means. And to me, what the Silk Road really means is this is an, was one of the very, very early attempts at globalization have organized globalization in the sense that, that at every step of the way, people wanted to get this stuff to one of the endpoints. And if we look at how our lives exist today, we can say that it's very much the same way. Certainly someone in Constantinople, certainly someone in Baghdad was unlikely ever to meet someone from Xi'an. Nevertheless, is that they were quite familiar with their goods in the same way as when we go on the internet and buy something from Delhi or Mumbai today. We'll probably never meet them, many of us will probably never go there, but we're able to interact with them and we're able to trade with them in a very organized fashion.